Moby Dick, Chapter Seventy Eight to Eighty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Stuart Wills. Moby Dick by Herman Melville, Chapter Seventy Eight to Eighty. Chapter Seventy Eight Cistern and Buckets. Nimble as a cat, Tashtego mounts aloft, and without altering his erect posture, runs straight out upon the overhanging mainyard arm, to the part where it exactly projects over the hoisted tun. He has carried with him a light tackle called a whip, consisting of only two parts, travelling through a single sheaved block. Securing this block so that it hangs down from the yard arm, he swings one end of the rope, till it is caught and firmly held by a hand on deck. Then, hand over hand, down the other part, the Indian drops through the air, till, dexterously, he lands on the summit of the head. There, still high elevated above the rest of the company, to whom he vivaciously cries, he seems some Turkish muezzin calling the good people to prayers from the top of a tower. A short-handled sharp spade being sent up to him, he diligently searches for the proper place to begin breaking in to the ton. In this business he proceeds very heedfully, like a treasure hunter in some old house, sounding the walls to find where the gold is masoned in. By the time this cautious search is over, a stout iron-bound bucket, precisely like a well bucket, has been attached to one end of the whip, while the other end, being stretched across the deck, is there held by two or three alert hands. These last now hoist the bucket within grasp of the Indian, to whom another person has reached up a very long pole. Inserting this pole into the bucket, Tashtego downward guides the bucket into the ton, till it entirely disappears. Then, giving the word to the seamen at the whip, up comes the bucket again, all bubbling like a dairymaid's pail of new milk. Carefully lowered from its height, the full freighted vessel is caught by an appointed hand, and quickly emptied into a large tub. Then, remounting aloft, it again goes through the same round, until the deep cistern will yield no more. Towards the end, Tashtego has to ram his long pole harder and harder, and deeper and deeper into the ton, until some twenty feet of the pole have gone down. Now, the people of the Pequod had been bailing some time in this way. Several tubs had been filled with the fragrant sperm, when all at once a queer accident happened. Whether it was that Tashtego, that wild Indian, was so heedless and reckless as to let go for a moment his one-handed hold on the great cabled tackles suspending the head, or whether the place where he stood was so treacherous and oozy, or whether the evil one himself would have it fall out so, without stating his particular reasons, how it was exactly there is no telling now, but on a sudden, as the eightieth or ninetieth bucket came suckingly up, my God, poor Tashtego, like the twin reciprocating bucket in a veritable well, dropped head foremost down into this great ton of Heidelberg, and with a horrible oily gurgling went clean out of sight. Man overboard, cried Dagu, who amid the general consternation first came to his senses. Swing the bucket this way! and, putting one foot into it, so as the better to secure his slippery handhold on the whip itself, the hoisters ran him high to the top of the head, almost before Tashtego could have reached its interior bottom. Meantime there was a terrible tumult. Looking over the side, they saw the before lifeless head throbbing and heaving just below the surface of the sea, as if that moment seized with some momentous idea— whereas it was only the poor Indian unconsciously revealing by those struggles the perilous depth to which he had sunk. At this instant, while Dagu on the summit of the head was clearing the whip, which had somehow got foul of the great cutting tackles, a sharp cracking noise was heard, and to the unspeakable horror of all, one of the two enormous hooks suspending the head tore out, and with a vast vibration the enormous mass sideways swung, till the drunk ship reeled and shook as if smitten by an iceberg. The one remaining hook, 
upon which the entire strain now depended, seemed every instant to be on the point of giving way, an event still more likely from the violent motions of the head. "'Come down! Come down!' yelled the seamen to Dagoo, but with one hand holding on to the heavy tackles, so that if the head should drop he would still remain suspended, the negro, having cleared the foul line, rammed down the bucket into the now collapsed well, meaning that the buried harpooner should grasp it, and so be hoisted out. "'In heaven's name, man!' cried Stubb. "'Are you ramming home a cartridge there? Avast! How will that help him? Jamming that iron-bound bucket on top of his head! Avast, will ye? "'Stand clear of the tackle!' cried a voice like the bursting of a rocket. Almost in the same instant, with a thunder-boom, the enormous mass dropped into the sea, like Niagara's table-rock into the whirlpool. The suddenly relieved hull rolled away from it to far down her glittering copper, and all caught their breath as half-swinging, now over the sailors' heads, and now over the water, Dagoo, through a thick mist of spray, was dimly beheld clinging to the pendulous tackles, while poor buried alive Tashtego was sinking utterly down to the bottom of the sea. But hardly had the blinding vapour cleared away, when a naked figure with a boarding sword in his hand was for one swift moment seen hovering over the bulwarks. The next, a loud splash announced that my brave Queequeg had dived to the rescue. One packed rush was made to the side, and every eye counted every ripple, as moment followed moment, and no sign of either the sinker or the diver could be seen. Some hands now jumped into a boat alongside, and pushed a little off from the ship. "'Ha, ha!' cried Dagoo all at once, from his now quiet swinging perch overhead, and, looking further off from the side, we saw an arm thrust upright from the blue waves." a strange sight to see, as an arm thrust forth from the grass over a grave. "'Both! Both! It is both!' cried Dagoo again with a joyful shout. And soon after Queequeg was seen boldly striking out with one hand, and with the other clutching the long hair of the Indian. Drawn into the waiting boat, they were quickly brought to the deck, but Tashtego was long in coming too, and Queequeg did not look very brisk. Now how had this noble rescue been accomplished? Why, diving after the slowly descending head, Queequeg, with his keen sword, had made side lunges near its bottom, so as to scuttle a large hole there. Then, dropping his sword, had thrust his long arm far inwards and upwards, and so hauled out poor Tash by the head. He averred that upon first thrusting in for him, a leg was presented, but well knowing that that was not as it ought to be, and might occasion great trouble, he had thrust back the leg, and by a dexterous heave and toss, had wrought a somerset upon the Indian, so that with the next trial he came forth in the good old way, head foremost. As for the great head itself, that was doing as well as could be expected. And thus, through the courage and great skill in obstetrics of Queequeg, the deliverance, or rather delivery, of Tashtego, was successfully accomplished, in the teeth, too, of the most untoward and apparently hopeless impediments, which is a lesson by no means to be forgotten. Midwifery should be taught in the same course with fencing and boxing, riding and rowing. I know that this queer adventure of the gay headers will be sure to seem incredible to some landsmen, though they themselves have either seen or heard of someone's falling into a cistern ashore, an accident which not seldom happens, and with much less reason, too, than the Indians, considering the exceeding slipperiness of the curb of the sperm whale's well. But, peradventure, it may be sagaciously urged, how is this? We thought the tissued infiltrated head of the sperm whale was the lightest and most corky part about him, and yet thou makest it sink in an element of far greater specific gravity than itself. We have thee there. Not at all, but I have ye. For at the time poor Tash fell in, the case had been nearly emptied of its lighter contents, leaving little but the dense, tendinous wall of the well, a double-welded, hammered substance, as I have before said, much heavier than the sea-water, and a lump of which sinks in it like lead almost. 
but the tendency to rapid sinking in this substance was in the present instance materially counteracted by the other parts of the head remaining undetached from it, so that it sank very slowly and deliberately indeed, affording Queequeg a fair chance for performing his agile obstetrics on the run, as you may say. Yes, it was a running delivery, so it was. Now, had Tashtego perished in that head, it had been a very precious perishing. Smothered in the very whitest and daintiest of fragrant spermaceti, coffined, hearsed, and tombed in the secret inner chamber and sanctum sanctorum of the whale, only one sweeter end can readily be recalled, the delicious death of an Ohio honey-hunter, who, seeking honey in the crotch of a hollow tree, found such an exceeding store of it that, leaning too far over, it sucked him in, so that he died embalmed. How many, think ye, have likewise fallen into Plato's honey head, and sweetly perished there? Chapter 79 The Prairie to scan the lines of his face, or feel the bumps on the head of this leviathan, this is a thing which no physiognomist or phrenologist has as yet undertaken. Such an enterprise would seem almost as hopeful as for Lavater to have scrutinized the wrinkles on the rock of Gibraltar, or for Gaul to have mounted a ladder and manipulated the dome of the Pantheon, Still, in that famous work of his, Lavater not only treats of the various faces of men, but also attentively studies the faces of horses, birds, serpents, and fish, and dwells in detail upon the modifications of expression discernible therein. Nor have Gaul and his disciple Spurzheim failed to throw out some hints touching the phrenological characteristics of other beings than man. Therefore, though I am but ill-qualified for a pioneer in the application of these two semi-sciences to the whale, I will do my endeavor. I try all things. I achieve what I can. Physiognomically regarded, the sperm whale is an anomalous creature. He has no proper nose, and since the nose is the central and most conspicuous of the features, and since it perhaps most modifies and finally controls their combined expression, hence it would seem that its entire absence, as an external appendage, must very largely affect the countenance of the whale. For, as in landscape gardening, a spire, cupola, monument, or tower of some sort is deemed almost indispensable to the completion of the scene, so no face can be physiognomically in keeping, without the elevated open-work belfry of the nose. Dash the nose from Phidias's marble jove, and what a sorry remainder! Nevertheless, Leviathan is of so mighty a magnitude, all his proportions are so stately, that the same deficiency which in the sculptured jove were hideous, in him is no blemish at all, nay, it is an added grandeur. A nose to the whale would have been impertinent, as on your physiognomical voyage you sail round his vast head in your jolly-boat, your noble conceptions of him are never insulted by the reflection that he has a nose to be pulled. A pestilent conceit which so often will insist upon obtruding even when beholding the mightiest royal beetle on his throne. In some particulars, perhaps the most imposing physiognomical view to be had of the sperm whale is that of the full front of his head. This aspect is sublime. In thought, a fine human brow is like the east when troubled with the morning. In the repose of the pasture, the curled brow of the bull has a touch of the grand in it. Pushing heavy cannon up mountain defiles, the elephant's brow is majestic. Human or animal, the mystical brow is as that great golden seal affixed by the German emperors to their decrees. It signifies, God, done this day by my hand. But in most creatures, nay, in man himself, very often the brow is but a mere strip of alpine land lying along the snow line. Few are the foreheads which, like Shakespeare's or Melanchthon's, rise so high and descend so low that the eyes themselves seem clear, eternal, tideless mountain lakes, 
and all above them in the forehead's wrinkles you seem to track the antlered thoughts descending there to drink, as the highland hunters track the snow prints of the deer. But in the great sperm whale this high and mighty, godlike dignity inherent in the brow is so immensely amplified, that gazing on it, in that full front view, you feel the deity and the dread powers more forcibly than in beholding any other object of living nature. For you see no one point precisely, not one distinct feature is revealed, no nose, eyes, ears, or mouth, no face, he has none proper, nothing but that one broad firmament of a forehead, pleated with riddles, dumbly lowering with the doom of boats and ships and men. Nor, in profile, does this wondrous brow diminish, though that way viewed its grandeur does not domineer upon you so. In profile you plainly perceive that horizontal, semi-crescentic depression in the forehead's middle, which in man is Lavater's mark of genius. But how? Genius in the sperm whale? Has the sperm whale ever written a book, spoken a speech? No, his great genius is declared in his doing nothing particular to prove it. It is, moreover, declared in his pyramidical silence. And this reminds me that had the great sperm whale been known to the young Orient world, he would have been deified by their child Magian thoughts. They deified the crocodile of the Nile, because the crocodile is tongueless, and the sperm whale has no tongue, or at least it is so exceedingly small as to be incapable of protrusion. If hereafter any highly cultured, poetical nation shall lure back to their birthright the merry May-day gods of old, and livingly enthrone them again in the now egotistical sky, in the now unhaunted hill, then be sure, exalted to Jove's high seat, the great sperm whale shall lord it. Champollion deciphered the wrinkled granite hieroglyphics, but there is no Champollion to decipher the Egypt of every man's and every being's face. Physiognomy, like every other human science, is but a passing fable. If, then, Sir William Jones, who read in thirty languages, could not read the simplest peasant's face in its profounder and more subtle meanings, how may unlettered Ishmael hope to read the awful caldi of the sperm whale's brow? I but put that brow before you. Read it, if you can. CHAPTER 80 THE NUT if the sperm whale be physiognomically a sphinx, to the phrenologist his brain seems that geometrical circle which it is impossible to square. In the full-grown creature the skull will measure at least twenty feet in length. Unhinge the lower jaw, and the side view of this skull is as the side of a moderately inclined plane resting throughout on a level base. But in life, as we have elsewhere seen, this inclined plane is angularly filled up, and almost squared by the enormous superincumbent mass of the junk and sperm. At the high end of the skull forms a crater to bed that part of the mass, while under the long floor of this crater, in another cavity seldom exceeding ten inches in length, and as many in depth, reposes the mere handful of this monster's brain. The brain is at least twenty feet from his apparent forehead in life, it is hidden away behind its vast outworks, like the innermost citadel within the amplified fortifications of Quebec. So like a choice casket is it secreted in him, that I have known some whalemen who peremptorily deny that the sperm whale has any other brain than that palpable semblance of one formed by the cubic yards of his sperm magazine, Lying in strange folds, courses, and convolutions, to their apprehensions, it seems more in keeping with the idea of his general might to regard that mystic part of him as the seat of his intelligence. It is plain, then, that, phrenologically, the head of this leviathan, in the creature's living, intact state, is an entire delusion. As for his true brain, you can see no indications of it, nor feel any. The whale like all things that are mighty, wears a false brow to the common world. 
If you unload his skull of its spermy heaps, and then take a rear view of its rear end, which is the high end, you will be struck by its resemblance to the human skull, beheld in the same situation and from the same point of view. Indeed, place this reversed skull, scaled down to the human magnitude, among a plate of men's skulls, and you would involuntarily confound it with them, and remarking the depressions on one part of its summit, in phrenological phrase, you would say, This man had no self-esteem and no veneration. And by those negations, considered along with the affirmative fact of his prodigious bulk and power, you can best form to yourself the truest, though not the most exhilarating conception of what the most exalted potency is. But if, from the comparative dimensions of the whale's proper brain, you deem it incapable of being adequately charted, then I have another idea for you. If you attentively regard almost any quadruped spine, you will be struck by the resemblance of its vertebrae to a strung necklace of dwarfed skulls, all bearing rudimental resemblance to the skull proper. It is a German conceit that the vertebrae are absolutely undeveloped skulls. But the curious external resemblance, I take it the Germans were not the first men to perceive. A foreign friend once pointed it out to me, in the skeleton of a foe he had slain, and with the vertebrae of which he was inlaying, in a sort of basso relievo, the beaked prow of his canoe. Now, I consider that the phrenologists have omitted an important thing in not pushing their investigations from the cerebellum through the spinal canal, for I believe that much of a man's character will be found betokened in his backbone. I would rather feel your spine than your skull, whoever you are. A thin joist of a spine never yet upheld a full and noble soul. I rejoice in my spine, as in the firm audacious staff of that flag which I fling half out to the world. Apply this spinal branch of phrenology to the sperm whale. His cranial cavity is continuous with the first neck vertebra, and in that vertebra the bottom of the spinal canal will measure ten inches across, being eight in height and of a triangular figure with the base downwards. As it passes through the remaining vertebrae, the canal tapers in size, but for a considerable distance remains of large capacity. Now, of course, this canal is filled with much the same strangely fibrous substance, the spinal cord, as the brain, and directly communicates with the brain. And what is still more, for many feet after emerging from the brain's cavity, the spinal cord remains of an undecreasing girth, almost equal to that of the brain. Under all these circumstances, would it be unreasonable to survey and map out the whale's spine phrenologically? For viewed in this light, the wonderful comparative smallness of his brain proper is more than compensated by the wonderful comparative magnitude of his spinal cord. But leaving this hint to operate as it may with the phrenologist, I would merely assume the spinal theory for a moment, in reference to the sperm whale's hump. This august hump, if I mistake not, rises over one of the larger vertebrae, and is therefore in some sort the outer convex mould of it. From its relative situation, then, I should call this high hump the organ of firmness or indomitableness in the sperm whale, and that the great monster is indomitable, you will yet have reason to know. End of chapters 78 to 80